Uh, hello students, my name is Shibani Ghosh. Um, I'm an environmental lawyer. I practice in courts um, uh, specializing in environmental cases. I also do research and writing on various environmental uh, law and regulation related issues and I'm associated with a think tank uh, in Delhi called the Center for Policy Research. I have also been associated with the Central Information Commission which is the apex body under the Right to Information Act and I am involved in various research projects dealing with the right to information and environment. Now today the module that we are going to discuss uh, is on the environmental clearance process under the EI notification of 2006. Now as you know industrial activities and projects like power plants, mining, highways, uh, setting up industries, construction, they all require different types of permissions, approvals, consents uh, before commencing operations. And several of these consents or approvals are required under environmental laws. One such approval or consent is called the environmental clearance, which is given to projects after uh, a rigorous assessment of the potential impacts of the project uh, on the environment as well as after undertaking a rigorous public consultation uh, involving people who are interested in the project as well as communities uh, who will be potentially affected by the project. Once that process is over, uh, an environmental clearance may be granted by the concerned governmental agency and this clearance has to be obtained by the project proponents before they commence any prior or before they commence any operations. Now what are the, uh, what, what do we hope to achieve through this uh, module? First of all, um, I will try and um, explain to you the rationale behind why an environmental clearance uh, is required uh, by, from uh, various projects. Also what is the real uh, procedure through which uh, project proponents can apply for the environment clearance and what, is, what are the various stages in that process, which are the in, important institutions that are involved and the stakeholders and al actors that are involved in the process. And then we will finally move on to what is the grievance address or mechanism that is relevant and also uh, what are the different concerns that have arisen over uh, the last 8 years in the design and implementation of uh, this notification of 2006. Now moving on to first what is the rationale uh, behind requiring projects to obtain an environmental clearance before they commence operations. Uh, the main uh, reason or the main uh, kind of the foundation principle for requiring environmental clearance is to ensure that the environment is protected from any adverse impacts which are likely to be an outcome of industrial or infrastructure development. Uh, related activities. Now co what could these potential impacts be? For example, air pollution, water pollution such as groundwater contamination, uh, depletion or degradation of habitats and forests, um, wetlands, grasslands get uh, affected, impacts on existing livelihoods, uh, destruction of flora and forest species. These are the various impacts on the environment. Now the environment clearance process is meant to ensure that these projects, these development activities are only permitted if their impact on the environment is minimal and adequate uh, measures are taken to prevent any adverse impact on the environment and if there is likely to be any adverse impact to minimize the same. Now this would require that before an environmental clearance is actually granted that we need to understand what are the potential impacts of the pro proposed project and for that uh, a proper assessment has to be undertaken. Now this assessment is based on scientific and technical studies which are called, which form together the environmental impact assessment study or the EIA report. These reports along with public consultation that is undertaken around the project site uh, uh, involving people who are affected or interested by the project. Uh, is then considered by the relevant agencies to decide whether this project should be granted an environmental clearance or not. Now let us step back a bit the, to see what is the relevant law uh, which governs uh, the environment clearance process. Now the main law uh, in this regard which is relevant to us is the Environment Protection Act of 1986. 
The Environment Protection Act empowers the central government to take all such measures for protecting and improving the quality of the environment and preventing, controlling and abating environmental pollution. Along with that, the central government also has the power to restrict areas or regulate areas in which any industry, operation or process or class of industries, operations or processes shall not be carried out or shall be carry out, carried out along with certain conditions. Now this power of the central government to restrict the areas or to regulate the areas in which certain kinds of projects can come up is really the basis for the environmental clearance process. And this has led to the notification that was issued in 2006, which is commonly referred to as the Environmental Impact Assessment or EIA notification of 2006. The first thing that the EI notification of 2006 does is to categorize all projects based on their spatial uh, extent and the potential impact of these projects on human health, and natural and man-made resources into categories A and category B. Category A are projects which, requ which will require a clearance, an environmental clearance uh, from the central government through the Ministry of Environment and Forest and Climate Change and Category B projects will obtain an environmental clearance from the State Environment Impact Assessment Authority or SEIAA which is a state government appointed agency. Now let us go back and discuss certain examples of what are Category A and Category B projects. If you look at coal uh, based thermal power plants, Thermal power plants which have a capacity of 500 megawatt or above are categorized as category A projects. Those below 500 megawatt capacity are categorized as category B projects. In case of mining projects, those which are undertaken in acreage of 50 hectares or, hectares or more are categorized as category A and those below 50 hectares are categorized as category B. Now there are certain projects such as airports, ship breaking units, oil and gas transportation pipelines which are massive uh, infrastructure related projects which are of national importance which are always categorized as category A projects and certain smaller projects such as solid waste management facilities or uh, common municipal waste facilities which are smaller projects which are always categorized as category B projects and as I said category A projects receive clearances from the central government and category B projects receive clearances from the state government. However, there are certain exceptions to this rule. In some cases, category B projects which are located uh, for instance within 5 kilometer radius of a protected area such as a national park or a wildlife sanctuary or uh, they are in close proximity to a critically polluted area or an eco sensitive area or they are near an interstate uh, boundary. These projects even though they are category B projects, uh, they are required to approach the central government for a clearance. So therefore, they are treated as category A projects for all practical purposes. Now this EI notification 2006 as I said uh, get, gets its source from the Environment Protection Act. So the EI notification 2006 has been issued by the central government which is the nodal agency being the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. As that is the nodal agency, it has the power to make amendments to this notification. It has the power to ensure the implementation, proper implementation of this notification. It can expand and restrict the scope of this uh, notification as well. So it can exclude certain projects uh, from its implementation or it can increase the kinds of projects which require uh, environmental clearance. Now, what are the main institutions that are involved in the grant of the environmental clearance? At the central government level, as I mentioned earlier, these are the category A projects and certain category B projects. Uh, the main agency is the Ministry of Environment and Forest and Climate Change or MOEFCC, which grants the environmental clearance and is also responsible for monitoring uh, the conditions or, or rather monitoring the compliance of conditions that are laid 
in the environmental clearance. The second set of institutions of the central government which are important for our purpose, purposes are what are referred to as the expert appraisal committees or EAC. EACs are specially constituted bodies involving experts in different areas. Um, they only have a recommendatory role. Uh, they, they appraise different documents related to the project including as I mentioned the EI reports or the public consultation which we will come to uh, a little later in today's uh, presentation and they give their recommendations to the Ministry of Environment and Forest Climate Change. At the central level there are at least eight such committees which look at different types of projects. So, for example, there is a different uh, EAC for coal mining projects, there is a different EAC for hydropower projects and there is a different EAC for nuclear power projects. For category B projects as I mentioned earlier, it is the projects gran are granted clearance at the state level. The agency that is the final, uh, rec uh, final regulatory body or the body which grants the final clearance is the State Environment Impact Assessment Authority or SEIAA which is responsible for actually granting the clearance as well as for monitoring the compliance of conditions in the clearance. Very similar to the work that is done by the MOEF with regard to the category A projects. Similar to the expert appraisal committees that we just discussed, we have the state appraisal expert appraisal committees SEACs at the state government level to give recommendations to the SEIAA based on appraisal of different documents um, such as the EI report and the public consultation minutes of uh, the hearing. The third, third set of institutions is the state pollution control boards. These are pollution control boards set up at every state. Uh, these are responsible for organizing public hearings and uh, which is an important part of the public consultation process. They also the, they are also assisted by the local administration, for instance the district collector, uh, the subdivisional magistrate, the Zilla Parishad, all these institutions at the local level are also involved in the environment clearance process to a certain extent, particularly at the public consultation stage. The final institution that is important for our purpose is the National Green Tribunal, which is a specialized court. Uh, based in New Delhi but with different branches across the country which listen, hears matters and decides matters with regard to the environmental clearance process and we will come to the role of the National Green Tribunal towards the end of our presentation today. Now as I said toward in the beginning, the crux of the in this notification of 2006 is that the environmental clearance has to be obtained prior to any commencement of sorry prior to the commencement of any operation. Any new project or expansion of an existing project or modernization of an existing project or capacity enhancement requires such an environmental clearance. In August 2010, the MOEF clearly stated that projects which have not received environmental clearance cannot undertake any form of activity including civil construction or cutting down or felling of trees. Projects which have not got environmental clearance but do have access to the project land, the maximum they can do is fence the land and uh, to prevent encroachment and to construct a temporary guard shed if necessary. Other than that, no other activity is permitted at the project site unless an environmental clearance is obtained. To begin the process, the project proponent or the company owner submits a number of documents to the relevant regulatory agency. As I said before, for category A projects that would be the Ministry of Environment and Forest Climate Change at the central government and if it is a category B project, these documents would be submitted to the SEIAA or the State Environment Impact Assessment Authority. Now what are these documents? Form 1 and Form 1A in case of construction projects. These two forms provide the basic information about the project such as where is the project situated, what is the capacity of the project, what are the raw materials that will be required in the project, uh, who are the people who will be affected, what kind of employment will be generated, so basic information about the project. The project proponent will also along with the form 1 and or form 1A submit what are known as the draft terms of reference. 
Draft terms of reference or TORs are proposed by the project proponent uh, as what would form the basis of their EI report. What are the terms or what are the criteria based on which the project proponent proposes to undertake the EI study. Along with that, a pre-feasibility report would also be submitted. All this information is then propo, uh, uh, put forward or for, uh, to the expert appraisal committee in case of at category A projects and can, in case of category B projects, it would be forwarded to the state expert appraisal committee. Now we have the four broad stages of the EI process. The first stage is called the screening stage. This stage is relevant only to category B projects. At this stage, the state ex expert appraisal committee looks through the documents that have been submitted by the project and decides whether this is a category B1 project or B2 projects. And this is based on the nature and location of the project and certain guidelines that the MOEF has given. The distinction between B1 and B2 projects is that B1 is considered to be higher in magnitude, higher in potential impacts and B2 is considered to be relatively smaller. And because B2 projects are relatively smaller, these are not required to undertake an EIA study or an environmental impact assessment study. However, as you must remember, screening, the stage of screening, which is the first stage in the process is not relevant to category A projects. It is only for category B projects. The second stage of the process is what is known as the scoping. At this stage, the expert appraisal committee or the state expert appraisal committee in case of category B projects will consider all the documents that have been submitted by the project proponent. It may even consider undertaking a site visit although that is optional, not mandatory. And based on these documents and its experience, because as I said earlier, these, these committees include experts, they will issue the final terms of reference. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the terms of reference are the basis on which the environmental impact assessment studies are carried out. So therefore, they define the ambit of the impact assessment studies. So the expert appraisal committees can propose their own terms of reference. They can uh, customize or revise the terms of reference that had been uh, submitted by the project proponents. If these TORs are not properly assessed, or I am sorry, if these TORs are not properly addressed in the EI report uh, that the project proponent prepares, the EAC or the SEACs can even reject the proposed project proposal. Therefore, I just want to emphasize on the importance of the terms of reference uh, in the whole process. The project proponents have to respond to every, terms of every term of reference that, it, that is issued to it. At the scoping stage, which is stage 2 itself, the EAC or the SEAC can decide to reject the project itself. It can uh, decide this based on the documents if it believes that the adverse impacts on the environment is, will not be mitigated by the project and are too high and irreversible in nature for the project to be carried out. So at the second stage, the scoping stage itself, the project proposal can be rejected and the project proponent or the company has to be given reasons by the expert appraisal committees and the MOEF or the SEIAA why their project has been rejected. After the scoping is over and the terms of reference has been issued to the project propon proponent, the project proponent engages an external agency such as an environmental consultant to undertake an environmental impact assessment study for the proposed project. These studies could take varying lengths of time. They could, uh, it, it could be a rapid environmental impact assessment, which means it's undertaken only over one season. It could be a comprehensive EI report, which means that the environmental impacts over the whole year or all seasons have been considered before preparing the report. Most project proponents prefer the rapid EI because it's undertaken in a shorter period of time, although it could be said that it is not an adequate impact assessment because it does not take into account seasonal variability. Once these assessment studies are over, a draft EI report is prepared 
and along with the summary of 10 pages is submitted uh, by the project proponent. Now we come to the third stage of the process which is the public consultation which I referred to briefly earlier. The public consultation has been defined as the process by which the concerns of local affected persons and others who have plausible stake in the environmental impacts of the project or activity are ascertained with a view to taking into account all material concerns in the project or activity design as appropriate. However, certain projects such as building and construction projects, townships, uh, individual projects between within big industrial estates, B2 category projects, certain expansion projects need not undertake public consultation. However, projects such as thermal power plants, mining projects, hydropower projects, um, nuclear uh, airports, massive industries, all these projects and development activities, infrastructure activities require public consultation. Public consultation under the EI process has two stages. The first is that of public hearing where at the site of the project or close proximity to the site of the project, uh, the state pollution control board organizes a hearing. The second stage is where written responses or representations are sought from concerned persons who may have a plausible stake in the environmental aspects of the project. Now these people who are involved in uh, submitting written responses need not be people who are uh, directly affected by the project or who live in close proximity to the project. They could be anyone who has any interest or plausible stake in the matter. Now before the public hearing commences, there are uh, several uh, kind of procedural requirements. The first, the project proponent writes to the concerned state pollution control board. So for example, if the project is a mining activity being undertaken in the state of Odisha, then the Odisha state pollution control board will write, uh, will undertake, will be uh, approached by the project proponent. The project proponent will submit the draft EI report along with the summary in English as well as in the local or official language of the state, for example, in Odia in hard and soft copy to the concerned state pollution control board. These documents also have to be submitted to the local administration offices such as that of the Gram Panchayat, the Zilla Parishad, um, the district industries offices, all local administration offices where the project is being undertaken would also be required to be served with the documents. Now it's important that these documents are provided to these local offices because it is the only way through which affected communities and people can come to know details about the project and the potential impacts of these projects so that they can raise concerns, ask questions, submit representations about the project based on the information provided to them. Before a public hearing is held, a notice has to be issued by the State Pollution Control Board at least 30 days in advance. And this notice has to be published in at least two newspapers, which is one could, uh, and both national language, I mean, I'm sorry, a national daily or a, and a regional daily. So it has to be one in English language and one in a regional language, uh, giving information about where the public hearing is going, is going to be held and also the offices in which the documents are being kept for people to come and peruse if they are interested. The draft summary of the, uh, the summary of the draft EI report has to be also made available on the Ministry of Environment and Forest website. Now during the public hearing, uh, no, there is no quorum requirement. Uh, even if there are two people present at the public hearing, the public hearing can be continued. However, all those people who are attending the public hearing have to mark their attendance. Uh, a public hearing once scheduled cannot be postponed unless there are certain untoward kind of emergency situations. Uh, it is facilitated by the district magistrate or the district collector and the project proponent is invited to present details about the project and what are the measures that are being undertaken by the project proponent to minimize their adverse impact assessment. The whole event is video recorded by the State Pollution Control Board and any person in the audience who wishes to ask a question or seek any clarification or express his or her opinion has to be given an opportunity. No one can be denied an opportunity to speak at such a public hearing. Once the public hearing is over, the panel prepares the minutes of the meeting or the minutes of the public hearing and then reads these minutes back to the people in the audience to verify that the minutes actually reflect 
uh, the what act, uh, what happened or what occurred during the hearing. The agreed minutes and the video that has been prepared by the State Pollution Control Board are then sent to the Ministry of Environment and Forest Climate Change in case of Category A projects or to the SEIAA or the State Environment Impact Assessment Authority in case of Category B projects. Once the public hearing is uh, over, the proceedings are displayed conspicuously outside the local offices and of course, as I mentioned before, rip written representations may be sent by any person who is interested in the project raising doubts, asking for clarification or submitting additional information with regard to the project uh, to the MOEF and the SEIAA. Once this is over, the project proponent is required to address the material environmental concerns raised during the public consultation and submit a final EI report revising its earlier draft based on issues raised by the uh, people during the public consultation. For example, if there is a project coming up on the coast, um, say in the state of Maharashtra and people such as the fishermen are not satisfied with the kind of marine impact assessment that the project proponent has undertaken, the project proponent could undertake another additional study to see what the impact of its project is going to be on the marine biology and include this in the final EI report. Unfortunately, this final EI report is not made available to the people and they, therefore they have no way of verifying whether their concerns have actually been addressed. Now we come to the last stage of the process which is the appraisal stage which is defined as detailed scrutiny by the expert appraisal committee or the state expert appraisal committee of the application and other documents like the final EI report outcome of the public consultation including the public hearing proceedings submitted by the applicant to the regulatory authority uh, concerned with the grant of environmental clearance. The, during this meeting of the EAC when it is looking through all these documents, the EAC may invite the project proponent to come and uh, explain uh, certain aspects of the project or respond to certain uh, questions or queries raised by committee members. They could also require project proponents to undertake additional studies. After all this process is over, the EAC or the SEAC make categorical recommendations to the Ministry of Environment and Forest Climate Change or to the SEIAA whether to grant clearance or to reject clearance to the said project. Generally, uh, MOEFCC and the SEI accept these recommendations, but there have been occasions when they have overruled these recommendations or have requested the expert appraisal bodies to reconsider their recommendation. If, the, uh, if finally the MOEF decides to reject an environment clearance application, it has to give its reasons to the project proponent. However, if it accepts the environment clearance application, a clearance letter is issued to the project proponent which includes various conditions uh, which the project proponent has to meet before it starts operations or even during construction and operation of the project. For example, it could be required uh, to undertake catchment area treatment if it is coming up near a, a, a river. Uh, it could be required to undertake certain measures to protect groundwater from leaching. It could be required to undertake afforestation uh, measures. So there could be several conditions that the project proponent is required to meet or comply with uh, after it has received the environmental clearance. Once the environmental clearance letter uh, is received by the project proponent, it has to make sure that this is advertised on its website. It is advertised in two national dailies in English language as well as regional language. That information about these clearance is available on the website of the MOEFCC or the SEIAA and the State Pollution Control Board. The concept behind this of course is to make sure that people know that the project has uh, been granted clearance and what exactly are the conditions based on which the clearance has been granted so that people can subsequently verify if the project proponent is actually meeting or complying with those conditions. The job or the onus of monitoring the compliance of these conditions lie with the Ministry of Environment and Forest and Climate Change with regard to Category A projects and with regard to Category B projects, the onus lies on the State Environment Impact Assessment Authority. Now coming to grievances within the system. Now uh, suppose the en Environment Impact Assessment Report 
include certain false information or there is deliberate concealment of certain information with regard to the project site or the impact of the projects. An example could be that a project is coming up in a wetland which is ecologically very important and fragile and the EI report writes that this is not a wetland but a wasteland which is an entirely different nature of land then this would constitute false representation or deliberate concealment of information. In this case, if it is found that the EI report is um, providing false information, the application for environment clearance can be rejected and if the clearance has been uh, has already been granted, then it can be subsequently cancelled. And if the project proponent has already undertaken certain kind of construction, it would be to the financial loss of the project proponent who would then have to uh, break down any sort of uh, any form of operations which may or construction which may have already begun. Uh, if work is commenced before any environment clearance is granted, um, then there could be an imprisonment penalty or uh, the company may be required to pay a fine uh, or the head of the company may be uh, punished to go into uh, jail for up to 5 or 7 years. Finally, if someone is not happy that an environment clearance is granted he or she or an organization may file an appeal against such a decision uh, before the National Green Tribunal. Similarly, a project proponent if its uh, clearance application has been rejected can also file an appeal before the National Green Tribunal. Now we come towards the end of our uh, discussion today which are some of the main concerns with regard to this process. Of course, there are several concerns that have been raised by activists, civil society groups, um, local uh, panchayats as well as industries and government, government agencies uh, who have raised problems with regard to the design and implementation but I will just highlight three, or three such problems. First is that as I mentioned the EI report that is prepared is actually prepared by a consultant um, hired by the project proponent. Therefore, the credibility and accuracy of this project is extremely suspect because there is a clear conflict of interest between the EI consultant and the project proponent. The EI consultant uh, since it is paid by the project proponent is likely to give a very glorious account of what the project is uh, proposing to do. Secondly, while the public consultation is a very important part of the whole process, uh, there have been several cases where issues raised by the people during the public consultation do, are not reflected um, in the discussions before the appraisal committee and nor are they reflected in the final EI report. As I mentioned earlier, peop the people, the local people, the affected communities do not have access to this final EI report and therefore they are actually not in a position to verify whether their concerns had actually been taken into account. And finally, a third concern that I would like to highlight is that even if a clearance is granted to a project proponent, the monitoring mechanism in uh, our government systems today is very poor. So, all the conditions that the project is supposed to comply with, for example, if there are any corporate so social responsibility related measures such as building a school uh, or a primary health clinic or roads or to ensure that uh, there is a green belt, all these conditions which are included in the environmental clearance which the project proponent has to comply with, he may not comply with and that is not pro properly monitored and they are not uh, held accountable for these kind of violations. To summarize today's discussion, uh, we, dis we started the discussion by looking at why project proponents and industries require uh, environmental clearances. We looked at the relevant law which is the Environmental Protection Act of 1986 and the EI notification 2006 that has been issued by the central government under it. We discussed the uh, main institutions at the central, state, government and the local administration. We looked at the four stages of the process, screening, scoping, public consultation and appraisal, ending with the final decision whether to grant clearance or not as well as the post clearance monitoring mechanism. We discussed some of the grievance redress, uh, grievances that may ri arise such as violations of the law, what could be the penalty provisions and we ended by discussing the major concerns uh, that have been highlighted over the last eight years of this EI notification 2006 and the environmental clearance process being in force. I thank you all for being part of this discussion. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much.